Hey folks, and welcome to another edition of Zog Science. Today we're going to be talking about evolution and uh, kind of in just an introduction, um, talk a little bit about some of the evidence that Darwin compiled to come up with his theory, and then just kind of the basic tenets of uh, his theory for evolution. So uh, <clears throat> for this first little bit, um, evolution, well, what is it? It is descent with modification, or at least that's how Darwin has described it. Um, uh, it started off uh, as a pretty uh, simple orgasm, uh, organismal level, um, but now it kind of pervades all of life. Um, we talked a little bit in the last unit about how genes and genomes can evolve. So it doesn't just happen on an organismal level. Um, uh, again, it's a general theory. Um, it is not a specific theory for only one context, but rather a much more general theory that uh, is the uh, running theme throughout all of biology. And it is supported by many facts and observations that have been done over a long period of time. Uh, and again, as with all science, uh, the theory of evolution has been added onto as our knowledge increases. So today we're going to kind of get into the basics of it. And then as we move forward through our evolution unit, we're going to continue to add more and more onto it. Uh, just give us a little bit of historical context for Darwin and his ideas. Um, there were a lot of uh, scientists that came before him that Darwin added uh, onto, and we're going to talk about some of those um, today. But a lot of the things that were going on kind of occurred in this period um, from about the, the early 1800s until about 1850, 1860 or so. Um, so, you know, there's a pretty short time span when a lot of these things were being investigated. So the first thing we're going to talk about is Georges Cuvier, um, and what he was—he was a, a paleontologist, and he was looking um, at fossils. And what he kind of noted was that as you went into older rocks, um, you can you um, you got more fossils that were different from what you might see today. Um, and when you got younger fossils or younger uh, rocks, you got fossils that were more similar to what you might see today. And so basically he kind of inferred that, all right, at some point we were having a lot of extinctions or maybe not necessarily at one point, but over time there have been a fair number of extinctions that have wiped out different species. Um, and so again, we get kind of the idea that we have, um, we have some change that is occurring over time. Uh, the next guy uh, is Thomas Malthus, uh, and he um, was studying um, populations and how they change. And specifically, he was kind of looking at human populations, although it, it applies to other populations as well. Um, and his observations were um, when you have a limited amount of resources, um, which there are always, um, at some point you're going to reach the limit of those resources. Um, those resources are only going to be able to sustain a certain population size. And when the population size uh, exceeds that level, um, then you're going to have things like disease, war, and famine um, that are going to occur as people are going to be competing and fighting for those resources. Um, and a lot of times the population is going to become uh, going to get pulled and back into check because of those disease, war, or famine. Uh, next, we've got Charles Lyell and Hutton, and these, these are two geologists. Um, Hutton, uh, he proposed that the Earth's features were due to gradual mechanisms, so things like um, a river carving out a canyon um, or mountain building. Um, and Lyell, um, he thought that the same processes that we observe today uh, have been occurring in the past. And the two of them kind of combined together, um, you kind of get this idea that the Earth is much older than a few thousand years old, which was the prevailing belief um, at the time. And so because of that, you now have this idea that, okay, there's a lot of time for evolution to occur. Uh, finally, we've got Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck, and he proposed that evolution occurs over time. Um, however, his uh, mechanism for evolution was slightly different from that that Darwin um, proposed. His mechanism was kind of twofold. First of all, um, organisms acquired traits from their parents, um, and the traits that they acquired could be built up through use or disuse. So basically, his idea was that if you got a blacksmith, right, a blacksmith is using a big hammer to hammer out metals, right, he's going to get very strong, develop smart, large muscles, he's going to be able to pass on those traits to his offspring. And his offspring are going to have larger muscles than somebody else's offspring because of the fact that the blacksmith has built up um, his, his muscles over time, over the time of his life. Um, this is not true. Um, an example of this that kind of disproves that is bonsai trees. Um, bonsai trees are curated and cultivated to be small. However, they start off as a normal-sized tree. As you can kind of see in the picture over here, this tree is not, you know, super small like a, 
like a bonsai tree rather this is the in the process of kind of being curated to become a much smaller tree um now we did kind of talk about in epigenetics we talked about the fact that methylated right traits could be kind of passed on methylation patterns could be passed on and those methylation patterns uh, are environmental so there certainly is a little bit of two Lamarckian evolution that is true. Um, you know, the, the idea that evolution occurs over time and organisms tr change is true, um, but also a little bit about the uh, um, about acquired traits, although certainly not in the way that he kind of thought um, was uh, uh, in terms of the mechanism, how it occurred. All right, so let's talk about Charles Darwin. So just kind of like Watson and Crick, Darwin synthesizes a lot of these different ideas, right? And he puts them together into a single unifying theory. Um, and the most important experience in his life um, in terms of putting together this theory was a voyage that he took on the HMS Beagle. Um, and he went around the globe, including a very, very, very famous stop in the Galapagos Islands. Uh, so this is the voyage of the Beagle. Um, they left from Great Britain and traveled down. The original intent of the voyage was to simply chart waters off of South American coast, um, and they did that. Um, and one of the kind of more interesting experiences that he had before he got to the Galapagos was that they actually he was actually uh, able to experience an earthquake um, in Chile. Um, so while they were kind of on, on the back side of South America, although I guess there's really no front or back, uh, the west side, excuse me, of South America, um, and one of the things that he noticed was that after the um, after the earthquake, he noticed that the uh, that the rocks had actually shot up several feet. Right. So he was able to kind of see a geologic process occur um, while he was there. He also was reading Lyle's book at the time. So he's being influenced by Lyle's ideas while he's seeing that, um, which obviously had a very large impact on him. Um, eventually, he got to the Galapagos Islands. Uh, and while they were in the Galapagos, Darwin observed a lot of species. And what he found was that he had just been in South America. And so when he got to the Galapagos, he, see, he saw a lot of species that were very similar to those on the mainland, but they were distinct. They had um, some you know, characteristics that were different. Um, for example, um, they have marine iguanas in the Galapagos. These are the only marine iguanas, the only iguanas that are able to swim. Um, he saw giant tortoises, and each of the islands has their own kind of version of the giant tortoise. They're all a single species. Um, however, each of them has a unique shell, and that's because of the different cacti that the tortoises like to eat. Um, and then he also very famously saw the different species of finch. Again, each island had its own species of finch, um, and each of oh, those finches has a unique beak that allows them to eat different types of food. Um, eventually, they you know conclude their voyage. It's like a seven-year voyage, um, and it's not for another 20 years um, that Darwin actually publishes his book, The Origin of Species by Natural Selection, um, which is this famous book where he lays out his ideas of evolution by natural selection. Um, and uh, the kind of the impetus for that was there was a guy, uh, Russell Wallace, uh, I believe Alfred Russell Wallace, um, who writes uh, him a letter and says, hey, I have these ideas about, you know, evolution. I know you've kind of been talking about them. You know, would you look over them? And uh, Darwin noticed that Wallace's writings were pretty much the exact same theories as his own. And so he quickly writes Origin of Species or, or rather finishes writing it. And, and publishes it. Uh, kind of an interesting story. Um, and Wallace, you know, uh, was very gracious and kind of deferred to um, to uh, Darwin in terms of allowing Darwin to take the majority of the credit. So kind of an interesting story um, in terms of, you know, kind of the more human aspect of the science. So <clears throat> what are kind of the basic principles of evolution by natural selection, the theory that was laid out by Darwin? Well, number one, we've got over overproduction of offspring variation among individuals, competition of for limited resources, only the fittest competitors survive and reproduce, and then finally, it occurs over long stretches of time. Let's take a look at each of those in a little bit more detail. Um, the over overproduction of offspring is very important um, because most offspring won't survive, right? So that's because of mostly either being eaten or starvation or you know, co you know, lots of different reasons, uh, but most of the offspring are not going to survive. Um, and this he kind of took from Malthus, right? So you've got, you know, lots and lots of organisms that are going to be uh, need to be produced so that some of them can survive. OK, now, because we have so many different individuals that are being produced, right, all of those individuals are going to be slightly different. 
Um, you can kind of see, look in the picture there, you can see these snails, right? They all have a little bit different, different sizes, different colors. And so some of the idea there is that some of the individuals are going to have traits that are advantageous. We would call that being fit. So that we would say that those organisms are more fit than others, or those individuals are more fit than others. Uh, finally, we've got competition for limited resources. So there's only so much space, food, water, mates, um, you know, uh, shelter, what else, you know, whatever else, there's only a limited amount. Um, and so individuals within species and between species are going to be competing for these resources. So you have a lot of offspring that uh, there's only a limited amount of, of resources, and some of those offspring are going to be better at getting those resources than others. Um, so because of that, only the fittest are going to survive and reproduce. So those individuals that have the traits that give them an advantage for collecting resources and or surviving or mating are going to be able to um, pass on their genes. They're going to be able to reproduce. And that's the key here. It's not just good enough to survive if you don't actually reproduce. Um, so we see this uh, fit, uh, fitness in terms of um, increased like, uh, being fit for mating uh, in birds of paradise. You can see that they all have these kind of crazy patterns, um, lots of coloration. Some of them build elaborate nests. Some of them have uh, specific dances. Um, and basically all of those, the, they're all the idea is that they want to be the most uh, fit to be able to mate. And so the females uh, in these species are very choosy um, and pick only the most brilliant or the, the best dancers or, or whatnot um, of the various different species. And then finally, the last part is that you have to have enough time. So this is where the ideas of Lyle and Hutton kind of come in. Um, you've got a lot of time going on because the Earth is, you know, found, you know, kind of at the time believed to be um, somewhere in the uh, tens of millions of years old. They hadn't really quite figured out that it was billions of years old yet. Um, but still, they believe that this was going to be enough time for us to have such a wide diversity um, of organisms that allow those organisms to change over time. So... Um, the idea is, you know, you've got these two mantids, right? Uh, and so uh, similar and uh, related to pr a praying mantis. Um, and so these mantids, you know, you can see that one in Malaysia, one in Africa, they're very different. They look very different. Um, and that's because, again, you've had all this time for the changes to occur. Um, now, an example of, of natural selection or evolution is artificial selection. Um, it works very similar to natural selection, except here we've got humans that choose the traits instead of the environment. So rather than organisms just randomly being fit and surviving in their particular environment, um, humans are actually selecting um, those traits that we believe are fittest. So, you know, being able to grow fast, um, having the best um, fruit, you know, the largest fruit, all those types of things are kind of looked at as being the most important. Uh, okay, so another example of evolution by natural selection is Darwin's finches. Uh, and again, you can kind of see very clearly the different beak styles. Uh, so this is a cactus eater, so it needs a kind of small beak to be able to get in um, to the cactus. We've got seed eaters that have a very large beak for being able to crack open the seeds. Uh, and then finally, we've got an insect eater, and these have very small, very uh, uh, um, uh, narrow beaks, and they're very good for reaching into holes and grabbing insects and pulling them out. Um, another example is drug or pesticide resistance. Uh, here we use drugs or pesticides, um, uh, and, and what happens is that when we use them, it kills off all of the pesticides except for those that are resistant, right? And so now you're left with only those organisms that are resistant. They are going to reproduce and eventually you end up with a population that is completely resistant. Um, this happens a lot with drugs. So penicillin was one of the first antibiotics that was ever discovered. Um, it is actually derived from a fungus. And so at this point, penicillin is not nearly as effective as it used to be um, because it, there's just so many different strains of different diseases, disease-causing bacteria that are resistant to it. Um, uh, an example would be HIV resistance. So uh, patients who take HIV drugs have to kind of rotate through what they call a cocktail because you have to take several different drugs because if you only take one drug at a time, uh, within uh, the order of a few weeks, um, the virus, the HIV virus within a patient is going to uh, develop resistance to it. And eventually, because one, you know, you're only going to kill off some of the, the virus, you're, not, you're never going to kill off all of them. Um, eventually, those, the viruses um, 
within the body are all going to be resistant, which is obviously a big problem because now your drug isn't working anymore. Um, we call these uh, kind of microevolution because it's evolution occurring on a very small time scale. Um, and then finally, common ancestry. Um, this is kind of the conclusion of, um, of evolution is that, all right, life has a lot of shared characteristics. So therefore, there must have, have at some point been a single common ancestor for all of life. And then lots of different organisms share common ancestors kind of along the way. Um, in general, when we talk about this, uh, common ancestor doesn't mean that that ancestor is still an extant, the opposite of extinct an extant species, um, rather those species have split apart and evolved in different ways. The ancestor, you know, ex used to exist, but is no longer around because it, it, it went extinct at some point. Um, so I think a lot of times people tend to think that, you know, oh, we evolved from, you know, gorillas or chimpanzees or whatever. Um, the reality is that we, us and gorillas and chimpanzees share a common ancestor, um, but however, it's not that we evolved from them. We just we broke off of the branch from them and have grown along the way. Um, and again, another kind of conclusion of this is we've got this whole tree of life. So here we've got the original, um, the uh, you know, at <clears throat> 400 million, four, sorry, 4,000 million years ago, four, 4 billion years ago, we've got the Earth uh, being born. And then eventually we've got bacteria starting. Um, somewhere around 3.5, 3.6 billion years ago. And we can see that everything kind of spreads off of from this point. Um, as you kind of go through, you've got different species that are evolving along time. And uh, we've got, you know, humans evolving very, very recently to today. Um, so this is kind of um, a lot of this information has been taken from DNA. Uh, we talked about a little bit about, you know, DNA in terms of DNA evolving. Well, we use that DNA evolution to kind of be able to trace back um, through and creating a tree of life. So anyways, I think it's pretty interesting. And the evolution unit, um, you know, it's going to take us a little bit of time. We've got a lot of things to talk about, but I hope that you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time.